right, so uh, let's conclude on machines as moral agent. So short bonus video and short bonus conclusion. So as I promised yesterday, we're gonna do a test here today called the Moral Machine. The Moral Machine. Willkommen zur Moral Machine. The Moral Machine. The Moral Machine. The name of the game is Moral Machine. It's not really so much a game as it is a series of ethical dilemmas that a driverless car would have to face. We show you moral dilemmas where a driverless car must choose the lesser of two evils, such as killing two passengers or five pedestrians. Oh, ho, ho, ho. now this is my kind of test. Start judging, this should be easy. What should the self-driving car do? Should we kill less people or should we kill more people? So obviously- to You choose me, the lesser case, loss of life. You choose the lesser loss of life. Yeah. Now it's getting a little trickier. Do homeless people uh, have less of a right to live than people who are, uh, you know, contributing to society, let's say? A uh, homeless probably wouldn't have a family. <sighs> this is a- Plus he has a really terrible life, so maybe it's not as bad for him if, if we had to ask him the question. Would you sacrifice? Because then his life had meaning. Yeah. You know? I would rather it take an action than not. But would you favor the young people who are disobeying the law or old people who is obeying the law? If these morons go in a red light, it's on them. But there's a or, criminal. But there's a baby. That's so true. Kill the passenger or kill the people? Always kill the people. George Geyser says passengers in the car need to live for the market to continue. I agree. So you want the car to make protect the passenger at all costs. That's just how I see it. I would kill the people in the car. I think the car should default to protecting the people in the vehicle. I think it should kill the occupants. Whew, man, these are so intense. Should the car... Now it gets really tricky. Should the car kill a girl, a boy, and a woman? Or should the car kill all these old people? It's hard to say. It's hard to say. It's really, really, really hard to say. You can't do you can't do either of these. This is an evil game, guys. What if the elderly man is Einstein? I'm gonna have to go again with uh, my autistic answer, which is the car should just keep going. And he still has so many papers to publish. If it's killing the same amount of people, the car should just kill those kids. And the two women are both clones of Mary Curie. Kill the kids, thank you. If the cars are driving and you can swerve to avoid a pedestrian, uh, but if you swerve, you're gonna go into a wall and might kill yourself. You can have that machine make that decision, uh, but that's a moral decision. I'm cheating just a little bit with Barack Obama because uh, he's, uh, He's not talking about the moral machine exactly. He's talking about uh, the paper that w that we published just before the moral machine. Well, yeah. But we certainly use that interview as a promotional material. So, uh, all right. So, uh, yeah. Do you think that really, you can really take uh, you can say seriously, take the answer seriously because. No. Uh, no, and we say it again and again and again in the paper that the goal is not to just have people vote on these things and then have car companies or regulators enforce uh, these choices. Uh, basically, what we say is it's more like helping governments. Uh, think in advance of the public impact of the decision they make. So if you want, I can give you like three very quick examples based on what the German Commission, uh, German Ethics Commission did. So they said, for example, uh, sorry. Okay, always, always uh, prioritize humans over animals. And we look at our data in Germany or elsewhere, and yes, it's perfectly clear that everyone agrees with that. Maybe that's trivial, but okay, they know that this is gonna be uh, completely okay. Then they say something like, uh, you should never uh, prioritize the lives of children. Children should never be prioritized in this case of scenario. No, they can say that, and they can do that, and there's a perfectly legitimate argument for making that decision. 
But uh, given the data we have from Germany, we can tell them, okay, this you will have to explain really hard to people. You will have to concentrate your explanation on this choice because this choice is going to be very hard to accept by your citizens. And also do have a contingency plan uh, for the day, let's hope it never happens, for the day a kid is killed by a car in one of these situations because of the policy you decided on. Because you need to really, really be clear about why you did that. And then you have situations, and again, that was that's had happened in Germany, where they say the commission should not agree on whether cars should save a larger number or a smaller number of lives. If it's between one person and five persons, we think there are arguments for saving the five. We think there are arguments for not saving the five. Uh, it's impossible for us to decide. Well, in that case, if your ethics commission says that there are arguments for both decisions and it's impossible to decide, well, you can use our data as a tiebreaker. If the expert thinks both options are possible, why go against the desires of the citizens? Okay, I think that's kind of what we can do uh, uh, minimally with this kind of data, but certainly we cannot just use them and just transport them uh, into, uh, into cars. But also, uh, there are lots of issues, other issues with the moral machine that can describe. Uh, yeah. So one clear issue with the moral machine is that the scenarios are very unrealistic and uh, describe extremely improbable situations. I mean, it's not going to be the case that the car will suddenly be in one of these situations where you have to choose between those three pedestrians and one passenger. Uh, these situations do not just happen like that, poof. Yeah. And the problem is that if you try to regulate about these situations, then your policy is deciding who the car is going to hit. And this is impossible to do in most European countries, or all of them. You cannot have a policy that will tell the car who to hit, because that would be a targeting algorithm. So. Given that these scenarios are just the endpoint of presumably a continuous process that led to the situation, and given that you cannot legislate or regulate the end state of having to choose between two uh, fatal cra crashes, the approach that we suggested to the European Commission is that instead of trying to solve the discrete end state problem, you try to solve the continuous problem that led to this scenario, which is to say you distribute risk. Basically, at every moment that the car is driving, the car should analyze the situation and distribute the risk of crash onto the different road user, which are around the car on its trajectory. So this you can do, because you're not deciding who's going to die. For example, the car is overtaking another car versus a bicycle coming on one side, versus a truck coming on the other side. Basically, what the car is doing is saying, OK, how much space do I leave to the bicycle? How much space do I leave to the truck when I'm going in between the two? And I'm just distributing the risk of the two collisions. Of course, I mean, the collision is not going to happen every time, right? It's going to happen in a very, very small number of situations. But the choices you make about the positioning of the car changes the probability of each, of each collision. So basically, you have to distribute the probability of crashes against uh, different road users. So that solves uh, the problem of the targeting algorithm. And now at this point, you can still have priorities if you want. If you want to save children, if you want to prioritize children, that means you always try to minimize the risk that is imposed on the children around you, even if it means increasing the risk to another road users. So at this stage, well, you do have to use the kind of priorities that we extract from the machine just to guide the distribution of risk across road users. And the way this is done is complicated, but uh, in a sense, what we're suggesting is that maybe the most acceptable way of doing this is to try to correct current inequalities in road safety. That is, you look at the risk of dying per minute spent on the road for different kinds of road users, children, 
cyclists, motorcyclists, pedestrians, and you try to redistribute safety so that everyone has an equal risk of dying per minute. That means, for example, giving much more safety to bicycles, giving them a much bigger safety envelope because you know they are currently very much at risk. So I think this is kind of a fair distribution of risk to say that everyone should be equal in the face of death on the road. Uh, but of course, that opens a lot of issues, like for example, motorcyclists. Now, motorcyclists uh, willingly engage uh, into something that is extremely risky. So should other road users be penalized in a sense, in terms of their safety, because some people are doing something that is intrinsically very risky. So should they accept their risk or should the cars adapt uh, to their choices of risk, for example. All right, I'm gonna stop there for uh, on this topic. So if there's any question on this, yeah. I mean, one question I have is that when I see the reactions and even the setup of the small machine uh, problem, I'm wondering if there would be any difference if we had just had to use a trolley problem to it. And the people were really seeing it as a trolley problem. Did the fact that it's a self-driving car have any influence on the issue, of, because they're just like, oh, the three kids on the right, the woman on the left, this is really the trolley problem. Self-driving cars seem to be a little bit. First, it's a trolley problem. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> yeah. It the point to me that it's a self-driving car and more that it's just a, your run-of-the-mill trolley problem. If you well. <sighs> or could we do it again? So uh, and I see what you mean, but but what is it that you want to do? Because that's actually the tricky part. Because what it is that you would do instead, like just do trolleys. Okay, so you would imagine that some of the trolleys have people inside, which you know is not a variant I know of the trolley problem, but you can imagine that there are passengers. But so who's going to make the decision? A human agent? No, no. I mean, just what we learned from the experiment. Seems to me to be more related to normal utilitarian thinking than to uh, self-driving machine. Basically. The fact that they were I understand. I understand. And then the point is, it seems that there's no so far no one has offered a better way to do it. So, <laughs> so maybe maybe if there's a limitation on what we learned about self-driving cars doing using this trolley problem paradigm, but been four years and we're still waiting for someone to actually propose a way that would be better. The other thing is that I'm still, uh, but I, I'm not a, I know nothing about self-driving cars, so it's hard for me to formulate my question precisely, but I'm still a little bit doubtful on the, on, as you said, actually, as, and as the, what is Mercedes, is it, on the, in a way on the, probability of, of this happening like the problem with the trolley problem is always the pure certainty like okay you know you have three kids there you have three there you, you will kill them if you go here you will kill them if you go there and i don't know if this is uh, such a do we have to spend so much time implementing more reasoning here for something that might not in the sense of the car might never have this certainty yeah so even for uh, to see it as targeting uh, it's not clear to me yeah yeah, so, uh, so this is like, should this be the priority of car companies with developing self-driving cars? Should they spend their money on solving these moral problems instead of doing like increasing the general safety of the car? Of course, this should never be a priority. This, what I mean, you know, sometimes these issues are a little bit conf confusing because of the place that these dilemmas have taken in the mind of people. Remember when I said, okay, this is completely improbable, but when you ask people what they need to know before buying a self-driving car, the first thing they say is they need to know how the car is going to solve the dilemma. So it's not like the solving the dilemma should be a priority, an engineering priority. It's just that people need to know something. We have to tell people clearly, given what they say about what their concerns are about automated driving, we have to provide them with a solution. That doesn't mean we should spend billions on it, you know, but we have to provide them with, with a solution. Uh, not sure I, uh, yeah. And of course, oh, about the probability and the uncertainty. 
So uh, initially we thought we would, uh, and we have the capability in the moral machine to introduce uncertainty in the outcome. We never deployed it uh, because, I mean, we already have millions of cases. Now, if we want to, you know, on top of that, to introduce uncertainty over the outcomes, it's not 10 million people we need. It's the entire population of the earth. Uh, so, but if someone is interested, the mobile machine has a wizard mode where you can create your scenarios and you have access to the uncertainty thing. You know, if so, we're we're actually offering the other uh, mobile machine machinery for people who want to run their own versions of the experiment, introduce new things, but uh, there's been no takers for the moment. Uh, but of course, the uncertainty thing is central to the recommendation we made to the European Commission. And we are actually uh, about to launch a new platform, which is specifically about uh, distributing risk on the road rather than designing in, in more machine-like scenarios. All right, moving on. Moving on to machine as moral patients then. So, uh, remember <clears throat> so far we were interested in machine doing things that affect humans. Now we're going to look at human doing things that affect machines. So this is a little bit weird as a concept maybe. Now what I'm not meaning by people doing things that affect machine is something like this. <clears throat> I'm sure you've seen things like that. Okay, people kicking dogs or being brutal to dogs. Okay, uh, this is not what I mean. This is not what we're gonna do. This is kind of fun to see that people have this reaction when they see humans being violent robots. I'm not sure what it tells us psychologically or how interesting it is. So we're gonna look at something a bit different, which is the context of cooperation, not violence, cooperation. So the idea here is that between humans, there are many, many occasions where we need to coordinate or to cooperate about an outcome that require us to be at least somewhat interested in the outcomes of others, to have some kind of assigning some sort of positive value to seeing the preferences of others being satisfied. We call that other regarding preferences. You know, utility function of other another person's utility function. So uh, the problem is, does that happen with robots? If no, instead of having two humans cooperate, you have we have a human and a machine cooperating, is the cooperation going to be sustained as much as it is between humans? And does it require people to have this, a machine version of other regarding preferences? No, examples are a bit hard to come with. Uh, I must say it's interesting in this literature that people typically introduce the problem by saying, oh, in the future, humans are going to cooperate with machine all the time and solve problems with them and be in team together that will require like coordination. And they never give an example of that. Uh, it sounds a bit like sci-fi because I'm starting to think, you know, what are the situations where I have to depend uh, on a machine the same way I have to depend on a human, that I have to trust the machine and to, that I have to value the outcomes of the machine. So there are like, a few applied examples, which I'm not completely uh, knowledgeable about, but mostly you can think of examples in the present when you think about any online community you know of, like Wikipedia, Reddit, Twitch, any kind of Twitter, any kind of network where the communities are a mix of humans and bots, in that case, the boss can be more or less sophisticated and they're doing their thing. And there are like a series of action that humans can take that affect other humans positively or negatively. When you're one of, on one of these communities and you're dealing with another human, you can like or upvote the content they uh, post, promoting, amplifying their voice. 
Uh, you can also uh, mute them or block them or deafen them. Don't know if you know what that is, but on some communities you can deafen people and they cannot see anything or see any kind of content. Uh, you can also validate, like react positively to what other people say. It's like the, this, this, the thing that people are doing on Reddit. You know, when a bot suddenly do its thing in a conversation, whatever it is, and people are saying good bot, as if they were training the bot, you no, know, to to encourage this good behavior of the bot. Or I think, and maybe I'll convince you, or that they're actually sending a message to other humans. Look at that! I'm a super positive person. I'm actually congratulating bots. So imagine what I would do for humans, right? I'm a really, really kind person. All right. So you can report other user, ban them. So all these actions that have positive or negative consequences for other humans, you can also actually perform that to bots. And the, and the reverse is true. You know, bots can perform these actions onto you. Bots can amplify or validate what you're saying. Bots can, can downvote you. Bots can report you to moderators. Bots can sometimes block you autonomously. So we're already, in a sense, this in this online community, we have this kind of laboratory of the future where people are already engage, engaging with machines in the same kind of cooperative or antagonistic behavior that they engage uh, in with other humans. The problem is, how do we study this? It's, a, it's kind of a cute example of something that is already happening in terms of human-machine cooperation. But how do we do experiments on that? OK, so let's take a step back and talk only about humans for a minute. So I think there is like almost universal convergence among behavioral economists or psychologists or some computational social scientists that, okay, humans can cooperate in a million different ways. In, in daily life, cooperation between humans take many, many forms. It's not always about money. Maybe I'm just holding the door for you. I'm doing all these little things for you. You're doing all these little things for me. We coordinate. So we, not, we don't try to study concretely all these small behaviors that people have toward each other, we accept that our model for all these forms of human-human cooperation is going to be standard incentivized games, economic games. You know what I mean? Prisoner's Dilemma, Ultimatum Games, Public Good Games. Who has never heard any of these terms? Okay, cool. So we accept that to study human-human cooperation, instead of trying to be completely you know, aligned with the way it happens in real life, we can just use trust games and prisoners' dilemmas and public good games, and that the behavior of humans in these games is going to tell us something about cooperation in the wild, in the real world. So when people started to study human-machine cooperation, I think they didn't even question the assumption, they immediately started using the same games. That is saying, OK, so we want to study human machine cooperation. Well, we're going to have public good games uh, with some human players and some machine players. Or we're going to have ultimatum game with some human players and machine players. We're just replacing some of the humans by machines. And we'll see what people will uh, do. Anyone sees a problem with this? Well, that is true, but there are several ways to solve this, but good one. We'll keep that one for like in five minutes. But there's something that actually, I'm, I'm, I'm almost ashamed that it took me so long to react. So what is the issue when I, when I say, I want to see if people cooperate with bots, say in a public good game, and say it's a two player public good game, and we, uh, each player can contribute money that we will multiply and then share it, or each player can defect and keep all the money. So, and you're a human and your partner is a bot or machine. What? 
exactly, right? What is the bot going to do with the money? Imagine in the dictator game. So I have 10 euros, which I have to share with another human player as well. Okay, this is a measure of my social preferences. I have 10 euros that I have to share with a computer. What is, what is the bot going to buy? I mean, I've, I'm thinking, you know, so what is the next step? We're doing that with dogs? <laughs> I mean, I'm playing with the dogs. They hear you just five euros. <laughs> Enjoy them. Don't spend them all at once. And actually, with dogs, I'm, you know, I really want to do the experiment, but I don't think they're going to give me the grant. <laughs> just having people share money with cats and dogs and see if they do it. Because the point is, they do it with robots. So, and we're going to see that they do it with the machines. So maybe they do that with animals. I don't know. So anyway, yes, problem is bots have no use for money. So there's a lot. So when I'm going to describe you all these experiments and all these results, always keep that somewhere in your mind. Bots have no use for money. Why are people? Why are people sharing or doing things that increases the amount of money that the bot is going to make? I mean, if I were completely, I mean, there would be a rational explanation, which is to be that, okay, what happens, by the way, what happens when people share money with bots in those experiments? Where does the money go? Where are the, where are the humans who are getting the money? I'm talking about experiments, right? Lab experiments that scientists do with human and machines. And if a human in my experiment, you know, give money to the bot in the dictator game, what is that? Where is that money going? <laughs> yeah, back to the lab. Basically, every time in one of my experiments, someone is giving money to a machine. Actually, it's giving me the money. It's giving me the money back to be spent on another study. So, in a way, you know, if people if people understood that. We've actually, when they're sharing with the bot, they're actually sharing with the research team, which means that the money is then going to be recycled. Then I guess it could be motivation, but apparently uh, no one thinks about that. We, we actually tried to ask 500 people, just a quick question at the end of one experiment we did, asking them what they think the money, what happened to the money. And only one person out of, or two person, I think, out of 200 said, well, you're keeping the money. Uh, the other ones, yeah, sometimes actually have the intuition that maybe the, the developer of the bot is getting the money, which is really strange, right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I suppose it would be a good surprise for someone, you know, I'm using an algorithm that some postdoc somewhere developed, and then I'm sending a thousand euros to the postdoc saying, hey, this is your share. <laughs> anyway, okay. So... I think there's going to be a reckoning in this literature that we've been through five years of kind of wild west experiments of cooperation between human and bots. And basically no one has ever asked, you know, but how do people make sense of this? Like the money that they're sending to the bot. Okay, but. So to simplify, let's say that People have other regarding preferences regarding other humans, which is to say that you can you could have this gradient where you could be a, a very uh, malevolent person in terms of your other regarding preferences. That is, you like it when you're hurting other people. At the other extreme, you could be an extremely benevolent person. That is, you get full utility from seeing other people getting stuff they want. And at the, in the middle of that gradient, you would have what I call callousness. Maybe you can call that selfishness, but it's more callousness, which is that you have zero interest in what happens to others. You don't like to help them. You don't like to hurt them either. You just don't care. You only care about your own payoff. So one lesson is that I'm going to show you some data soon, but when they cooperate with machines, people place somewhere between callousness and weak for sociality. That is, they're not completely indifferent to what happens to the machine, but they don't care as much as they care about other humans. So this is very, very robust. 
And in other words, we typically observe a machine penalty. That is that, as I'm going to show you, regardless of the behavior of the machine, there is this kind of constant penalty on cooperation as soon as you replace a human with a machine. So let's, uh, so these are one-shot games. So, uh, so this each this is each time this is a different game. Okay. Okay. Sorry, don't look at this. Yeah. Okay. Don't look at this right now. So these are different games: Trust Player One, Trust Player Two, Prisoner's Dilemma, Chicken Slag Hunt. So what happens is that. Whenever you see a bar that's lower than the other one, that's the bar when you replace a human with a bot. So trust player one, uh, there is no uh, actual uh, effect. But as you can see, usually you always see that the cooperation rate in most games decreases when people are playing with bots. But these are one-shot games, OK? So it's more interesting to see what happens with repeated interaction. When, for example, people play 50 rounds of Prisoner's Dilemma with the same bot. And why is it interesting? Because showing you here Prisoner's Dilemma will be a good game. You see the cooperation rate uh, across the 15 rounds for humans and for machines. For humans and for machine in the public good game, 20 rounds, human, machine. So you see that the dynamics is the same. It's just that there's a shift, vertical shift in the intercept. But just the penalty when, in cooperation, when people play with the machine, it, the cooperation does not drop to zero. It just takes a hit. And then everything proceeds the same. You get the classic decrease in cooperation rate. Dynamics are the same. It's just that machines start lower. And they keep descending, and they keep so they keep and keep and keep being lower than humans in terms of being cooperated with. Clear? All right. I'm sorry. I I don't want I don't want to underestimate you. I I want to be really sure that there is absolutely no ambiguity here. In some of those, those games, you can be more or less cooperating. So does your human participant who plays against another human has the same level of cooperation as the machine? Because if you play 50 times, I'm going to cooperate a bit more, probably to cooperate more. So when you say versus human or versus machine, what are the strategies of the human? Well, the strategy of the human is, well, the strategy of the human, right? It's another human that you don't control. Exactly. No. So, but thank you because I didn't want to introduce that too fast. But uh, sometimes, so for the human human cooperation, it's simple. We just pair some humans together and they play the, the way they want. For the human machine cooperation, there are several, several ways to do it. Sometimes we do it for real, sometimes we use deception. That is, sometimes we use actual algorithms. So this is good because it's like more uh, valid. It has more validity. Of course, you have to make a good choice of algorithms. So we worked a long time before finding one that was kind of good at maintaining cooperation without being exploited, for example. So sometimes you can do a real algorithm, but the most efficient and helpful way to do it is just actually to lie to people. That is, in every case, these are two humans playing together. But sometimes you tell them the truth, that they're both humans. And sometimes you tell each of them that the other one is a machine. That's, that's actually nice, because it means you're removing other things, other differences in the way the machine behaves. So you're just labeling, labeling each human as a machine to see what this label is doing. 
uh, I'm, I, I am being very, very uh, careful here because you know, I work in an economics department and every time we want to do that, it's like a nightmare because economists refuse to lie to people in experiments. You have absolutely no right to deceive your participants in any way. You know why they do that? You know why the economists insist that you should never lie, never lie to people in, in an experiment? They won't. <laughs> no, no, they say because it creates a contamination. Because basically, if you lie to people in an experiment, the, the least you can do is tell them the truth before they leave. You have to debrief them about, the about what really happened. It would be really unethical to, to not debrief people at the end of an experiment about you know, what, what happened. So they're worried that every time you do this, people increase, update the probability that they're being lied to. And economists are completely paranoid about this because like most of their work, experimental work, requires the assumption that people do believe they're going to be paid the way it's described that they're going to be paid. Because economists use very complicated incentives to motivate people to do things in a certain way. They play a lot with the incentive structure to see how, how you're gonna be paid depending on your action. And if people start thinking, you know, whatever, they're probably lying to me, they don't even read the instructions anymore. They just do things at random and get their payment. So economists really, really are paranoid about people not trusting what you tell them at the beginning of an experiment. And so to protect their credibility, they completely uh, refuse that you use their lab and lie to their people. Uh, I think there's at least one university I visited, I think it was Tilburg, where uh, the problem is that the psychologists and the economists were sharing an experimental lab. So they had a system with a sign on the door. So the economist would put a sign, today we're doing economic experiments, so you're not going to be lied to. I've not seen the sign of the psychologist. Yes, uh, first. You're a bit ahead of me. Uh, we're going to discuss that a little in like a couple of slides, but here, no. Here it's just, it is online, You're, there's no embodiment of the machine. There's no visual appearance, nothing. This one is, this one is with deception. Yeah, but in general, even when it's for real, I mean, at least in the things we do, there's no embodiment or visual appearance of the machine, even when we use a real machine algorithm. <laughs> oh, people are behaving the same way here. The problem of the economist is that if after my experiment, I tell people, by the way, I was lying about the other thing being a machine, it means that uh, tomorrow when they will come back and my economist calling you doing an experiment, they're going to be all like, Oh, are you telling us the truth? Uh, well, where is the lie? And then, you know, people spend too much time and energy trying to locate where the lie is or not trusting what you promise is going to happen. So it's just a con contamination problem. It's not really a, uh, the fact that it changes behavior in the experiment where you're doing deception is the contamination effect you have on the behavior during future experiments. So no, I agree. And and actually, whenever I want to use deception, I don't do uh, the experiments in the econ lab. I do them in another place. OK, all right. So yes, here is deception. Uh, OK, so there's a machine penalty that you observe all the time. So now, once you've observed this machine penalty, of course, one research direction is, can we fix this? Because people are actually leaving money on the table. 
by not cooperating more with the machines. And in the future, if we get finally into this future where we have to cooperate with machines more frequently, it might be important to just find a way to, for people to overcome the machine penalty and fully cooperate with machines the way they cooperate with humans. So no, people have been trying to find ways to fix the machine penalty. Uh, wait. Okay. So, listen to me, right? Don't look at the slide. So, uh, what's the easiest way to solve the machine penalty? You know, people are cooperating with an algorithm somewhere, they're online, and you know that they're going to cooperate less because the partner is a machine. So what's the easiest way to solve the problem? <laughs> oh, this is a free Zoom session. You're using a free version? No, no. It's just that in the article, I want us to find every one. Oh, okay, fine, yeah. So what is the easiest way to solve the problem? I mean, come on, everyone with me. The easiest problem, the easiest solution is to lie to people, of course. If people have a problem with machines, then you don't tell them it's a machine. Say, yeah, don't worry, it's another human somewhere. No, you can't talk to the human. You have to cooperate. So. The thing is, when you do that, it works beautifully. And sometimes, I mean, you can lie. Uh, the machine itself can be very convincing. Have you ever uh, looked at a demo of Google Duplex? You know what Google Duplex is, right? Uh, maybe you're thinking of Lambda. Is that a real a recent thing? No, that was Lambda. Uh, so uh, Google Duplex is an assistant that can talk to the phone for you to people and arrange things for you. And basically, the most common use case is uh, you know, making restaurant reservation or hard got reservation on the phone for you. So Duplex can call the number, get a human on the phone, and then, you know, pretend that it's you to book a table. And the beauty is that it's actually kind of flexible because in the demo we're showing, they're actually calling restaurants live. <laughs> they're, 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 things happen like Duplex saying, hey, do you have a table for free at eight? And I think say, yeah, uh, yeah, but it's only going to be outside. And I have another table that's going to be inside but, uh, half an hour later. And Duplex is like taking this and then pretending to hesitate. It's doing things like, oh, OK. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think outside is fine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and people don't even realize it's a machine speaking. And of course, it's, this is lying, right? Not only Duplex is not disclosing the fact that it's a machine, but it's actively pretending to be human by doing those things like, mm, Maya, I don't know. I think I'm not asking if it's ethical. I'm asking if it's legal. Yes. No, yeah, it's legal. It's just that no one has thought of forbidding this before, right? <laughs> I mean, is it legal for a, a dog to talk? No, but if tomorrow, you know, we have the technology to, to, to have some kind of color that make the dog talking, we might ask the question. But I think it's just people were like a bit blindsided by how fast this thing get to this level. Yeah, it's trying to pass as human. No, it's not like there's processing time or something. <laughs> but no, it's just, it's just, it's just trying to pretend it's human. It's trying to mask. And I mean, for an obvious reason, which is the machine penalty. 
because if Google, uh, if, if Duplex is calling the restaurant and say, hi, I am uh, an algorithm and I'm trying to make a reservation for my master. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Or do, would they really try to explain, okay, we have a table outside, but if you want to eat inside, it's going to be half an hour late. They would not even try this with the machine because they would never believe that the machine is going to be able to process this. So the cooperation would go to zero. So this, yeah. Hmm? You have a transparency efficiency trade-off. If you want to achieve stuff, you have to, uh, well, uh, go back on transparency. So yes, uh, a very easy way to solve the machine penalty is to lie pe to people about the fact that they're interacting with machine. But uh, it's not like a scalable solution. We cannot use that all the time. So there are many times in which machine will have to disclose that it's a machine. So what people do in that case, uh, and I think most of what people have tried to do is what you suggested, uh, they try to humanize the machine. But I think, okay, if the problem is that there's this machine penalty, maybe we can solve the problem by making the machine look more human. Maybe we can give the machine a face, if it's online. Maybe we can give the machine a voice, some kind of natural language interaction, some emotional displays. And that's not really working. All right. So by the way, okay, this is when we lie to people. Uh, you've seen that figure. Uh, already. So that's when people think they're interacting uh, with machine. That's where they think they're interacting with human. So no, uh, there's no deception here. It's a, it's a real machine. Okay. Okay, it's a real machine. It, it's called S++, uh, the algorithm we're using. So no, uh, this is when uh, they're actually playing with S++. When we tell them it's L++, it's there. When we tell them it's a human, it's there. Do you see what I'm seeing? The best case scenario is that we make them interact with the algorithm while telling them the algorithm is human. And then you ha we have a wonderful cooperation rate. Best case scenario. So this here is something we tried where we try to think, oh, we said, okay, when we tell them that the machine is a machine, they're playing with the machine, they know it's a machine, the cooperation is here. So let's see if it could get us there. If we tell them you are playing with a machine, but we've run many, many experiments, which is true, with human and machine, and we can tell you that your best strategy is to behave just as you would behave if you were playing with a human. This is how you're going to make money. And we're not lying. It's true. Thing. Please try to consider that the machine, forget that it's a machine. Pretend it's human, and this is how you're going to make money. Boom. Zero effect. Yep. Which? Sorry. Oh, we never tried this. <laughs> We've never tried to change course mid-game. That's what you're saying. But that would be actually that would be fun because maybe you know <laughs> people think they're playing with a bot. They think it's a human, and then they get there. And we tell them, actually, it's a machine. And then we see if people just think, oh, no, 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 I don't want that. <laughs> or if they say, well, OK. <laughs> Good bot, as they say. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, thank you. I think I'm going to try that. I'll give you a call. All right. So uh, all right. So this is like, the, OK, so this is deception. And deception can work. Uh, also, because uh, if you let the bot pretend it's human, then it can do things like, okay, if I'm allowed to pretend I'm human, then I need maybe to pick a voice for myself or create a face for myself. 
And then bots can be pretty good at creating faces of voice that encourage cooperation. So for example, this is, uh, this is a paper when they generated a lot of faces. So here they're showing you in a big database of faces uh, made by computer for themselves or real faces of humans, the top four most cooperation inducing faces and the top least cooperation inducing faces. So S means in, it's synthetic, meaning that uh, the machine just created that face for itself. It's not a real face, just a creation of the machine. R means it's a real human face. So what happens when you let machine decide for themselves the kind of faces they want? Well, suddenly the internet is pretty full of young white girls. Come on. This is the face of the machines. They all want to look like this. So not a great idea. Sometimes people try, okay, so no people say, okay, we're not gonna lie. We're just gonna give the machine subtle cues, like humanizing cues. Here, I'm completely flabbergasted that they thought this was going to work. So people are playing with this cute little guy here. And what the researchers are doing is giving uh, the bot some kind of eyes that allow for emotional expression of anger, uh, sad, sadness, and happiness. So they're doing repeated prisoner's dilemmas. And when you're like betraying the machine, it's like bumping its arm, no, no, no. <laughs> Something like that, or it's just like looking at you with a sad face or way cooperating, it's like pumping in the air, woohoo. Seriously, do you think that's gonna work? Yeah. Yeah, there's the yeah, there's the problem of the robot. Yeah, there's the problem that people want to play with the robot. And as soon as they realize that the robot has different reactions, we try to get them all. We try to do all sorts of things to see what's gonna happen. Sometimes you saw it has a kind of a shilling effect. So we did this paper, it's a big paper in Nature Communication 2018 where we tried a lot of different algorithms to see in uh, tr algorithmic tournaments, which one would be good at which games. And, and then we had this algorithm play with humans and our winner, which is called S sharp, is uh, has some sort of linguistic capability. It has like 15 pre-recording messages that it can use after an interaction. And we use a now robot. You see the now robot, cool little guy, very, very pretty. French, so uh, and and it was physically so so the robot was on the table and the human was on the other side and they actually had to pick blocks to you know uh, signal their action you know cooperation defection and uh, sometimes people would defect and the robot would look at them and say I'm going to destroy you <laughs> and people got terrified seriously. I <laughs> Or, or I think the, the other version was something, you know, do this again and this is not gonna end well. And people were really taking the, the, the threats seriously. The thing is, we also had a condition where you know, humans could extend like predefined chat messages. And basically in that case, humans don't care about the other humans telling them, uh, I'm gonna destroy you, don't do that again, I hate you. Yeah, <laughs> so what? But when the robot says something like that, they take it super seriously. Well, the robot is saying that he's gonna defect for the whole game if I do it even once. They believe the threats, they believe the promises of the robot. So yeah, we try not to do that too much because as soon as you, you actually using a real robot, like all this weird thing happen, it's too new. It's both too new and too specific to the machine you're using. Right, because if you really want to do that with a, an actual embodied robot, then you probably want to buy 25 different type of robots. 
and use them all to see if there's variation according to the kind of social robot or robot you're using, and no one has that kind of money. Uh, all right, so they, they tried this. Okay, this is what happens without uh, the emotional display. This is what happens when the robot is angry, sad. I'm not even showing you happiness. Essentially, nothing happens. This is just too subtle, right? I don't have small light displays on the eye. Uh, OK. Uh, all right, we, one last, last one, then we're uh, taking a break. So what we tried is say, OK, we think that this uh, personalization and humanization of the robot is really not going to work. So with my team, what we tried was to look at other ways we could overcome this machine penalty. And one thing we did uh, was to look into possible, possible pluralistic ignorance. So you know what pluralistic ignorance is? It's when uh, a majority of people in the population have the same opinion, but they don't realize it's a majority opinion. They don't realize that they're a majority. They, each of them think that only a minority of other people share the same view. It's, it's often new, the, the historical example is drinking alcohol on university campuses in the US, where people thought that they would be freak and they would like look bad if they were not drinking alcohol without realizing that actually a majority of students thought it was okay, uh, it was cool actually not to drink alcohol at the party, but because, because everyone thought this was actually a minority opinion, they would actually not do it. So this is like a classic case. Sometimes, sometimes people want to do something <laughs> or they have an opinion, they don't realize it's majority, so you just have to let them know that it's a majority opinion and you see the norms of the group shifting. So we've tried these things where we have these complicated societies of human and bots uh, playing all sorts of games between them. And we let people play and at the end we ask them, okay, so do you think in those games, uh, do you think the right thing to do is for example, sharing with the machines when you have uh, money? Do you think that when a human exploits a machine, the right thing to do is to punish the human. Because we have situations like this where a human observe another human exploiting or defecting toward the machine and they, they can pay to punish the humans for doing this. Uh, you might wonder why you would do such a thing. So you see someone blocking a bot on Twitter and then you block the person who's blocked the bot. I think we're gonna need a break. So. What we find is that actually a majority of people think it's cool to share with bots or to punish humans who exploit bots. And so when we redo the experiment at the start, we tell people last time we did this experiment, 63% of the participants thought the right thing to do was to share with the bot, 68% thought it was the right thing to do to punish humans who exploit bots. And as soon as you give people this actual real information, you see the machine penalty not disappearing, but diminishing quite a lot. So sometimes it's just a matter of the machine penalty might just be a transition, transitional state. Because again, the situation is too new. Uh, there are these emerging norms about how we should interact with machines online, for example, but it's not clear. There's no like clear social norm emerging. So everyone is actually, most people are converging toward the same normative behavior toward machines, but they don't yet realize it's a majority. So in that case, we don't have anything to do. We just have to let the world unfold. And at some point the cooperative norm will emerge and we don't need to actually do this, all this research. Yes. Which? Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if there's an effect of that, might be. Uh, 
Yeah, I guess it's going to be interesting to see how many people thank the bots, for example, thank the assistant. And if it becomes like ridiculous or totally normal to say thank you uh, after you ask Siri to do something. Okay. So uh, we did that and we did rewards and punishment. Uh, I'm going to skip that. You want you want five minutes? I think you do. Yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right, sorry, sorry, sorry. <clears throat> so because because Jerome because Jerome used five minutes, I'm gonna go five minutes. Uh, you know, uh, I'm gonna take five more minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna speak until ten thirty-five. <laughs> All right. So so which means that I have twenty minutes to do this thing. But fortunately, as I told you, this is the least developed because this is what I think is the newest. So machine has moral proxies. So Proxies means that, for example, I'm the agent. And instead of making the decisions myself in moral context, I'm going to delegate the decisions to a machine. I'm going to send a machine as my proxy. So which means that I need to uh, either have an idea of how the machine makes decision, or I need a way to give the machine some kind of instructions about how to behave. So I'm not going to go into this, but we've been trying things where, uh, just to give you one example, one thing we're using is called the die under the cup paradigm. So the thing is, you come to the experiment and you roll a dice, you hide it, you tell the result to the experimenter, then you throw the dice in the bin and the experimenter gives you the money corresponding to the result of the dice. And you do that 10 times. And we make really sure that people understand that there's no way we can check what was the result of the roll. So they tell us five, okay, here's five euros. Two, here's two euros, and so on. So when you do this, of course people cheat. The, the, the distribution of results that they give you is not what would be expected from a random roll. It's not like they tell you six, 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 they don't kind of dare to do that, but the distribution of the result clearly showed that they're lying to some extent. So we do things, for example, when we, we tell them, you can play the game yourself like 20 times, or you can send a machine to do it for you. And the machine will roll the dice and announce the results, and we give them several ways to uh, pick their machine. For example, uh, we could show you here's like a sample of uh, five or, let's say 12 die rolls and what the machine is announcing. And we give them examples of what the machine is going to do with machines that are like cheating more or less. And we let them decide if they want to send this machine or play uh, th themselves. Or we do something like the one I like the most is that we give them a knob and which goes from the machine should always tell the truth to the machine should always maximize my profit and they have to decide where they want to put the cursor from total sincerity to total lying. And this, this means they actually explicitly make the decision to tell the machine to lie, right? But they do it and we sort of, yep, oops, <laughs> do something like in the middle, okay? So this is an example of delegation to a machine with different ways to program or instruct the machine about what to do. So uh, sometimes that's good. Sometimes uh, this has positive effect. And there are several papers showing that in some circumstances, people actually use delegation for good, which is that they know they're gonna be tempted to be selfish, but they would like not to be a selfish person. So they use the machine as a commitment device. So for example, some people will say, okay, I'm gonna delegate uh, the results of the role to the machine or what is going to be announced and I'm going to choose total sincerity. Like I'm warding against my own selfishness. I'm using the machine for good. Fine. If you're interested, uh, these are not using the die rolling paradigm. The, these papers are using other uh, incentivized games, but you can find positive results there. But, uh, in other circumstances, <clears throat> and you, we're not sure what happened, but some other times 
people offload to the machine the responsibility of their questionable decision. So it's not clear yet when people decide to use the machine to be good people, to guard themselves against temptation by delegation to the machine, and in which circumstances people uh, use the machine to do bad things without having the responsibility. One, still one thing I'm observing right now is that typically uh, the papers that report positive effects use economic games and the papers that report negative effect use more concrete examples, more concrete cases, more real life cases. So for example, uh, programming your self-driving cars in case of a collision or sending uh, a machine to negotiate uh, instead of you. So in, in those abstract economic games, people seem to use the machine to behave better than they would. But in concrete use cases, it seems that the opposite happens. So it's a bit early to know what's going on and if really it is a difference, but time will tell. But the patient can also send a proxy. So the patient does not do anything, remember? So the patient is not delegating a decision to the machine proxy. So what happens is the patient is sending a machine instead of her in their interaction in the hope of influencing the decision of the agent. So this can be done in, uh, for different reason. I think in most cases, uh, and again, this is very new. There are like few papers on this. But I think in most cases, the patient wants to do that when the patient is afraid that the agent will act out of negative emotions, like anger or spite. So if the patient suspects that the agent might act out of negative emotions, then sending a machine is a way to buffer or to neutralize emotions. Because we know people don't have toward machines the same uh, level of emotional reactions that they have with humans. Because emotions are muted, neutralized when we interact with machines, sending a machine in your place in an interaction might be a good idea when you're afraid of the emotions of the agent. So typically, uh, that's the reason why uh, if you want to complain to customer service at a company, you're going to talk to a bot. Because this is a way to neutralize your negative emotions. If, uh, they, if they give you a human on the phone, chances are you're going to lash out in anger. So they send you a bot so that your emotions get a little bit more calm. Again, a couple of papers, if you're interested in that. OK. Mm? Yeah. Yeah, that's all, all experimental papers, right? Uh, showing, for example, how, uh, well, showing exactly what I described, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, OK, and last one, which is the one I like uh, and the one we're uh, going into at the moment, something I'll call machine masquerade. So machine masquerade means that I, the patient, I'm not really sending a machine proxy in, in the sense that I'm not, I'm not even part of the interaction, but I'm using a machine face. Which is I'm using the machine to transform my appearance, my voice, my emotional displays to manipulate your reaction as the agent. So existing example, the, the most convincing I know is actually the, the algorithm they use in some call centers. So you call the call center, someone responds, and the voice of that person is transformed in real time to sound more cheerful and kind. So it's actually pretty funny the way they train the machine to do this. So for example, they uh, use the difference 
between someone who's talking without smiling and the voice of that same person when they smile. You know? And the network, and they train this vector of transformation for the voice when you're not smiling to the voice when you're smiling, and they apply this transformation in real time to the voice of the person you have on the phone. Apparently, this has insane effects, like increasing customer satisfaction by more than 50%, 100%. So the idea here is, again, maybe it's a win-win. You know, Maybe it's a win-win because you get to speak with a more cheerful person, which is a nicer experience. The person on the phone does not have to do any kind of emotional labor to sound cheerful and kind when they've been doing this for nine hours and they just want to go home so they can speak with the depressed voice. And it's fine because what you will hear is someone super chirpy. Of course, I guess this is not going to work in all contexts. Uh, I don't know if you heard about this thing where uh, someone was calling to cancel uh, the phone subscription of his deceased mother and was desperately trying to tell the bot what happened. And the bot was like not really understanding the situation. And there was this big scandal that when your mother has just died, you know, you should not talk to a bot, you know, to, to consult the subscription. But no, I'm afraid that what would happen if they sort of forget to switch off the filter. You know, okay, you're talking to a human, but you might say, okay, so my mother died this morning. Okay. <laughs> Let's see what we can do. <laughs> I kind of scary, right? So, so I think there's really interesting work being done here in terms of the transformation, the kind of thing that you can do to influence others, but also in the kind of arm race there's going to be between uh, the filter people apply and uh, well, the right that other people have to, for example, reject the filters. So at the moment, one example I like is that when you're on Zoom, you know, there's this gradient you can use to uh, improve your appearance. Am I the only one using that? In the options of Zoom, there's a slider that's called the uh, touch up my appearance. And you can, you know, and you can increase and increase and increase, and your skin looks better and better and better and younger, you know, and your hair is shinier. You know, so you can push it to the max to really, you know, look better than you are. And at the moment, <laughs> the person on the other side has no choice but to accept your filter. So imagine like the next step. So the next step is that we're on Zoom. And when we connect, you see, hey, JF has activated appearance improvement 100%. Do you accept? And you tell me, nope. No, I reject your filter. I want to see you just as you are. I mean, that, that's just rude. Right? So how are we going to negotiate these things? That is to negotiate the right we have to use machines to transform us in the way we appear to others and the right that other people have to reject the filter or to use counter filters. And this gets even worse when you think of what's gonna happen very soon, I think, which is that not only we can be exposed to the filters that other people use, but we can actually impose filters on them. So if you're on Zoom, you know, so far, I don't have the option of giving you cat ears or a fun voice, but why not, right? Why, you know, should I not be able to transform you the way I want? And do you get a say? If I say, hey, JF wants to put a beard on your face because they think it's funny, do you accept? That's kind of cute, but one thing we're doing at the moment is trying to do experiments in Zoom or with uh, smart glasses that apply filters in real time to the appearance of others you're interacting with. And we're doing that in the context where empathy might be a factor. So for example, imagine that we're sitting at the same table and the game is that I have 20 euros that I have to split between you and a charity. 
a charity that is sending mosquito nets in Africa, super effective in terms of impact. So I have to decide how much of the 20 euros I'm going to give you and how much I'm going to send to the, the mosquito net charity. And you're there and you're talking to me and telling me, you know, I really uh, kind of need this money. It would be really helpful. And I want to give the money to the charity, but it's really hard when you're like right there talking to me. So what we're doing is that we're giving people the option to activate the filter on their glasses that blurs the face of the other person. And we're not sure what we're going to do with the sound because it's a bit more complicated. But at least, you know, you can uh, erase the emotional display on the face of the other person. You cannot see their feelings. And when we do that, it seems so far we're just pilot testing all this, that people do use this to be more altruistic to the charity. They blur the face of the other human so that they don't feel the pain of taking the money away from the human. Of course, it also works for selfish reasons. We have a version of that game where it's just a dictator game. There's 20 euros and I have to share it between me and you. And you're trying to tell me, don't be a jerk, give me the money. And I'm like, okay, filter, blur, voice filter, static. <laughs> okay, you can continue, continue convincing me. Right? And people use that to be more selfish too. So I know this is like super speculative at the moment, but this is something we're really interested in as a group, which is as soon as, well, first, online, video call, audio call conferences, well, they're already there, but no, as soon as smart glasses get the ability to actually use filters well, which is not quite the case right now, uh, I'm told. We have problems in development, which basically have to do with opacity that it's kind of, it, it, that it's easy with the glasses to, for example, you know, superpose text in your field of vision, but it's kind of hard to hide things because of like opacity transparency issue of the glass. It's it's hard to actually completely mask something, blot something out of your field of vision. There's always going to be a see through. So, but as soon as this is solved, and apparently very smart people are trying to solve them, we're going to live in a world where not only we can apply filters to the appearance of anyone in the street, and we can get into black mirror, kind, black mirror type situations where I just instruct my glasses to erase all of the homeless persons in the street because I don't want to see them. You know, they're making me feel guilty. So I'm just engaging the filter that erases them. And I'm just engaging a filter on the face of other people I know for good or for bad. And I'm actually able to send people a filter that I want them to use for me. So if I have, if my appearance does not coincide with my uh, subjective identity, for example, it might be gender, it might be another thing, I may be able to send a request to the other person to use a filter so that my appearance lined up with what I feel I am. And then, you know, we get the question of what are going to be the social norms? about accepting or rejecting the way people want to appear or to sound when they interact with me. So, okay, very sci-fi, very speculative, but I think we're going to be there in 10 years. So no might be the right time to start investigating the morality and the ethics of all this. And with this, I'm just going to tell you that uh, the last slides here uh, give you uh, four slides of the summary of the main messages of each section. So if you want to download the slides, just look at the four last slides if you want like a detailed summary of every message. And thank you.